Hey guys, it's Matthew Zachary, and I want to tell you about the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, or the NCCN. The NCCN creates the treatment guidelines for doctors that help cancer patients lead better lives. But I want you to know that the NCCN also has guidelines for you. The patient guidelines were funded by the NCCN Foundation and were created just for people with cancer and their caregivers. They're free, they're easy to understand, and they're available right now for you, the patient and the caregiver. So go check them out at nccn.org slash empower. That's nccn.org slash empower. Hello, Heart of Healthcare listeners. Today's episode is all about digital health. We are going to dive into the macroeconomic landscape and what it means for digital health startups. After explosive growth in the first year of the pandemic, the amount of VC funding flowing into digital health in 2022 was about half of what it was in 2021. Meanwhile, exit opportunities have seemingly dried up as the IPO market plummeted and M&A has slowed down. Founders, investors, and employees of digital health companies? Let's find out. My guests today are Dina Shacker, a partner at Lux Capital, and Mo Maxumi, Managing General Partner of Healthcare at NEA. Dina, Mo, welcome to the show. Thank you, Holly. Great to be here. Yeah, we could make this more exciting than that ominous intro, Hallie. We'll do our best. <laughs> uh, it feels it feels a little depressing. So dun, dun, between dun. between the end of 2019 and the first half of 2021, digital health investors continuously increased investments into digital health quarter over quarter. But then from that peak in Q2 2021 until present day, investments have decreased most every quarter. Let's talk about this. You guys are the ones putting the money or not putting the money into these companies. So I'm happy to start and I'd love to hear Mo's perspective as well. You know, I think healthcare or not, the pace of investment and the dollar is uh, being deployed has slowed down since that height of exuberance, uh, which was putting gray hairs on all of our heads in 2021. But if you look just a year prior to, to 2020 vis-a-vis, you know, where where we were in 2022, the delta is actually not quite as big. So we're, we're not even thinking about like, you know, pre- 2019 or 2017 or whenever you want to put a sort of the the start point for that, you know, crazy cadence, even just to 2020, it actually is not that big of a difference. And so I would actually say relative to the other sectors that many of our funds are investing in, healthcare is continuing to see activity where, you know, I actually think we're seeing an outside, outsized number of digital health deals, you know, in these newsletters that we all get. And we're even seeing some massive M&A happening. Obviously, the big deals that we, you know, that we all point to, of, of course, the one medical acquisition by Amazon, Signify Health, Village, these are not tiny aqua hires. We're talking about multi-billion dollar acquisitions, which is providing some really interesting liquidity opportunities uh, in, uh, you know, in this current icy cold IPO market. Yeah, look, I think that's well said. I mean, you know, Dina, that's really good perspective. Like I'd go back even further, right? Like when I started (laughs) and I can do that because I'm old, you know, when I started at NEA, it it was um, June of 2000. And, you know, at the time, my mentor, Chuck Newhall is one of NEA's co-founders. He called healthcare IT investing the trailer park of venture capital. You know, and at the time, no one wanted to do it. By the way, it was it had a horrible acronym, HCIT. Like yeah, I was about to say, you've been just calling it healthcare. No. I, do I cannot say it. <laughs> um, and, and and like so, look, I think the categories come an incredibly long way, and you know, twenty years can seem like a lot, but in, in the grand scheme of things, evolving our four trillion dollar industry, it's not that long a period of time. And so, you know, I think that that 
almost anyone, Hallie, you know, would agree that the category had become overheated in a way that was not healthy and not sustainable from a capital inflow perspective, right? And that, and that manifested itself in terms of companies that shouldn't be getting funding were getting funding, companies that shouldn't be getting valued at certain levels were getting valued at those levels. And so I think any kind of correction or reset in a category that's that overheated is is going to be a healthy thing for the long-term sustainability of the of the asset class. And so I think what is happening in digital health today is part of the natural evolution of a category that just 20 years ago was attracting very, very little investment outside of a small company in, you know, rural Wisconsin, which is, you know, obviously now epic. So like fundamentally, I think the category is going to emerge more sustainable and stronger, but you know, it's it's going to mean there's some painful years, and I think it will be years, you know, before we kind of see a return to inflows and outflows that mimicked kind of that 2019 to, to early 21 time period. If I may, Hallie, just to add yeah. a yes, a yes and to that, and I agree, and Mo has, uh, you know, plenty of years of experience to speak to that, but I, I think it's more than a natural evolution. I do think that COVID, you know, was a watershed moment for the category. Perhaps it shed the water a little too strongly and now it's being pulled back, but I think that there are some things that are here to stay that happened as a result of the digital transformation that was impelled by COVID. Um, and, and that to me is, is, is something that probably accelerated years of, of, um, of digital yeah. innovation in the category. And I think both of those things can be true, right? Like the needs of healthcare consumers drastically changed and the space was overheated and probably, as Mo said, some companies that shouldn't get funding got funding. And right. probably and not higher just valuations the than they should have. Providers. And I think that's, and the payers. Yeah. And that's really where, it, what, what's yeah. here to stay. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, there's a lot of angst right now. And I think a lot of people feel like a recession is coming in 2023. Uh, whether or not that's true, I'm curious. Do you guys think healthcare is recession proof? And do you think that digital health is recession proof? Those are two separate questions. Yeah, very different. I, I, like, I, you know, I'd be curious for for Dina's thoughts. Like, I, I'd say, Hallie, that healthcare is recession proof, and as a category, right? Like, if you look at prior in, in recessionary and inflation cycles, by the way, demand for healthcare is proven to be immune from economic pressures. Right now, that's on the demand side. And candidly, you know, I think we have to separate demand from funding and honestly demand from payment, because what we know is during periods of recession, even though demand doesn't slow down collections and anyone that's got a rev cycle company knows this, collections do become more challenging. So I, I think that the, the problems around medical debt uh, and around collections for provider businesses will be come exacerbated during this period. But the demand side of the equation, we, we know will continue regardless of of the economic cycle. Now the question for digital health is, you know, when you combine a recessionary period with where we are on inflation and where we are on rate pressure, those three factors, you know, converging at the same time, I'm a student of history, like that is unique. And, you know, I don't know that we necessarily have a corollary for what happens to healthcare startups in an environment where you have recessionary pressure, inflationary pressure, and rate pressure, because, you know, the cost of capital soars and it becomes a lot harder to pay for stuff. So in that regard, I think you are going to see a separation of, of winners and losers. And I think the winners, as we think about it with a digital health lens, are going to be companies that can scale hyper efficiently from a capital perspective, right? And those are the ones that are going to be uh, breaking out versus the businesses in the past that maybe were able to get revenue, but get revenue at the cost of uh, absurd amounts of paid in capital. I think that's very well said, Mo. Um, uh, you know, I always say that healthcare in the sense of, you know, human health is recession proof in the sense that our kidneys and our hearts don't care what the macroeconomic climate is. People will continue to have babies, maybe not at the pace that they used to, but they'll, they will, they will get sick. And, um, and, you know, in many cases, there's actually, uh, you know, an increase of costs uh, when, it, when it comes to recessions and, and the, the healthcare needs of a population. That being said, I actually, you know, I personally don't think digital health is, is it's much better than healthcare IT, but I still don't think it's going to be a useful term in the years to come. I think all of healthcare will have to be digital in the same way that, you know, 
15, 20 years ago, tech was this separate category and now it's everything that we do. Healthcare will have to be enabled by tech across the board, not just in care delivery. We're seeing it on the R&D side in terms of clinical trial enablement. Uh, Obviously, you know, payers have had some element of quote unquote healthcare IT for a long time, but actually in the last few years, I think there's a little bit more appetite to to bring on some interesting, innovative things. I'm not saying chat GPT is necessarily going to be filling out EMR documentation anytime soon, although you know, maybe. But I do think that the category has a lot, a lot of white space still for for adoption of of technology. I think you're so right, Dina. And chat GPT actually provided the comments I I gave you earlier. (laughs) But like, but uh, um, I think I think you absolutely nailed it. You know, like we did, Hallie, it's so interesting, right? You know, this is where any is in our 45th year. and, And we did an analysis not too long ago. And of our top 25 largest returns in the history of our firm, 66% of them, two thirds came in in periods of of recession where those companies were created, right? So, Mm -hmm. you know, look, I think the silver lining here as we think about like the digital health startup ecosystem is, it's a great time to found companies. It's a great time to build product. Like, you know, I was going through my notes the other day and my archive deep in my outlook, uh, Hallie, and like NEA wrote a $50,000 check to Rock Health in 2011, right? Like, so, yeah. you know, if you think about where the world was in 2011, we were still, you know, not really out of the throes of the GFC. So like, I do yeah. think the silver lining here is like, it's it might be a hard time for incumbents. It might be a hard time for existing businesses to access, you know, equity and debt capital markets, but it's still a great time to build. Yeah. Yeah, it's almost harder for those that have uh, taken on a ton of capital versus those that might have just raised a seed round. Mm -hmm, Totally. You're like really trying to change course and what you're focusing on. Um, And I do want to talk about what you're focusing on because it feels like it used to be odd, like two years ago, if a digital health company was profitable, it was really like, what are you doing? Like, it's implying that it's not growing fast enough. Uh, But today... VCs, and I'm sure uh, you guys have perspectives on this, but really pushing companies and founders to focus on the fundamentals and profitability. So curious your take on that and how that has changed and which kind of companies are kind of best, which stage companies are best positioned to like weather the storm? Yeah. You know, I think, um, (laughs) Having an eye toward, you know, when profitability will come is something that hopefully was on the minds of many entrepreneurs, you know, uh, well before this moment that we're in. But it is increasingly very top of mind for investors and for and for founders. But I think what I would add to that that's more specific to healthcare is actually an eye toward outcomes. And hopefully mm-hmm. one day we are in a world where outcomes and profit are aligned completely. And then I think a lot of our healthcare problems will be solved. But uh, until we get to that, I think focusing on outcomes and improving patient health is something that I have seen a lot more people paying attention to, um, which is which is a great thing. Yeah, I, like I would say, and it's so interesting you say that outcomes, Dina, right? Like, you know, look, fundamentally, Hallie, I think that the, the very beginning of, of, you know, tech enabled healthcare investing focused on one met- metric, as a sign of success. That metric was revenue, right? Revenue slash yeah. members. Like, can you get that, right? Top then, line. Top line, right? <laughs> yeah. And then t- and then 2.0 was, well, can you get revenue? And then can you get medical outcomes at the same time? And then 3.0 was, you know what would be great is revenue, outcomes, and ROI to the payer or provider, right? And then 4.0, which is where we just came from, was can you have revenue, outcomes, ROI, and NPS, CSAT, like member satisfaction, right? Well, guess what? Like now we're finally in the the fifth stage, which is all four of those things, revenue outcomes, ROI, NPS, and something called unit economics, right? Mm -hmm. And like, that's why, I mean, that evolution, I think is, is what I was kind of like shading to earlier, which is that's a really good thing for our category. If we want this category, which all three of us do, and to be like a sustainable, not like a here today, gone tomorrow, like, you know, clean tech boom in the, in the early, you know, aughts, right? We want it to be like a, like, as Dina said, a, a kind of, you know, enduring 
part of the funding landscape and startup landscape, then unit economics has to be a part of it. And so, and that can mean, it, it mean margin. It can, it can mean, as you said, you know, EBITDA, free cash flow. And, you know, it's so interesting because so many people, and I, like, I'm probably guilty of this as well, right? Like d- would derisively refer to these like lower top line, but profitable companies as like, oh, that's a great lifestyle business, right? right? Like, yeah. oh, that's a, that's a nice little business. You know, but like, look, I mean, like, you know, no, I, That's like I, the biggest insult for a founder, too. Yeah. Exactly. Absolutely. <laughs> right. Like how many times does a founder hear that? Right. Like or, yeah. or maybe they can see the thought bubble above the, the VC's head in a meeting. Right. Thinking that. And so but but fundamentally, like I would say is like, you know, lifestyle businesses, if you want to use that derisive term, like it's their moment to shine. Right. Because fundamentally, <laughs> you know, like self sustainability is the new yeah hyper growth, right? Like yeah. that's what we're talking about. And like, we can like get in, get into a conversation around like where are the pockets that, that uh, are, I think are more ripe for building companies that are sustainable and where the unit economics work. And, but look, I think that that is a, all of us that want this to be kind of meaningful part of the venture landscape. It's a really good thing that unit economics is now on everyone's mind. Yeah. Well, okay, let's let's unpack. I love the idea of the evolution and I want to unpack it because there there are obviously drivers behind it. So when I think about the focus on revenue, a lot of it is so that you can get follow on funding. When I think about the focus on outcomes, it's so that you can sell to payers or sell to providers. Uh, When I think about kind of some of the newer pressures, it feels like trying to align these goals with the exit opportunities. Do you feel like that's, are there other drivers that I'm missing? Like, what are some of the reasons that these um, demands have evolved? Well, I, you know, I'll start and I love Dina's comments here as well. Like, I think fundamentally, like, you know, so much of of what we focus on uh, at these companies that we're building is reactionary, right? Like, Hallie, like we're reacting to the payers, providers, employers, or manufacturers who are in most cases the customer, right? Since we're not yet in a, in a true kind of D2C world for, for healthcare, you know, we're reacting to the government which is setting reimbursement for all of our, you know, Medicare and Medicaid revenue and 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 lives. And then we're reacting as you rightfully said to the to what do the acquirers, whether it's public market investors, private equity firms or strategics, what do they want in these assets that we're building and trying to create value for? And so today I would tell you that all three of those constituents are focused on unit economics like they want to know that they're that the platform that they are acquiring partnering with or investing in has a sustainable business model that is not going to depend on oh we'll just go raise more money because guess what it's really hard to go raise money right now and so like yeah. I, you know like look I, I think that the best use case for that is you know like I think there are a number of companies today that are uh, what I would call physician enablement businesses right and so these are companies that are you know, enabling providers to go do more with payers, right? Whether it's on, you know, the value-based care side, you know, whether it's on engagement, whether it's on outcomes, a mix of all three, like that's an area where you can like have a quantifiable uh, ROI to the provider, to the payer. And if you can do that in a way that's like building a sustainable company, like, you know, like I know we talk about the elusive triple aim, like that's the new triple aim, right? Can you please payer, provider and investor in a way that like, you know, kind of has something that's that's sustainable. And uh, look, I think that's just one category. I know Dina, you've, you've, you've invested in that category a, a number of times, especially in the women's health side, you know, really well. And I don't know, like, am I crazy? Like, do you think that's kind of an opportunity for building sustainable businesses now? I do. I absolutely think so. Um, and obviously share the, you know, the, the hope and, and the aspiration that this does become, um, you know, a durable category and one that's exciting. But one thing that's worth remembering, and, and Mo will definitely remember this because he was deep in it, you know, well before there was a major comp, but there really were not <laughs> exits to point to up until just, you know, yeah. maybe half a decade ago. Of course, there yeah. were, you know, some private behemoth companies or or others, but they were somewhat diversified. And so that was a lot of the pushback from the venture world. Like, is this really a category? Is this really a category? And so then we saw some big ones, how they're holding up in the public markets. <laughs> Let's not talk about that right now. Um, but we do, we, as I mentioned, we are also seeing some pretty massive deals being done in terms of M&A, which speaks to an appetite and a hunger from these large, like not traditional healthcare acquirers that the retail businesses and so on to take a slice of this massive uh, TAM. 
Hallie, this is this is playing out exactly how you thought it would in 2011 when you when you uh, founded Rock Health, right? Like you saw all this coming. Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> I, when we did our first rock report in 2011, it wasn't even two billion dollars that we could right. find in deals. Right. There were very few people. I, I, I mean, we were so gaslit <laughs> by <laughs> investors who just did not believe that technically technology had a place in healthcare mm-hmm. and that there was an entire new industry that could be built and transformed. But I, I will say I didn't, I did not expect COVID to be such a giant tailwind for growth. And then I certainly didn't think that it would kind of drop the way it has in the last year. What's exciting is that when you look at um, some of the data out of McKinsey for telehealth utilization, we have kind of stabilized at a place that's like 40 X what we were, you know, pre COVID. So I think what happened there is providers got comfortable using telehealth customers got comfortable using it. We kind of were able to push people past, you know, a point of realizing that there are cases when telehealth is more useful and easier payers started reimbursing. And then now we're at a new normal. So stuff like that gets me really excited. Um, But obviously wish we didn't have to go through this pandemic to, to reach that. Yeah, for sure. I, but I, th- I think that, like, y- you know, your point is a really good one. And I think, Dina, you made this earlier. Like, the, I think the tailwinds from the pandemic, although some of the artificial surge has normalized, right? But the tailwinds are going to persist in terms of how members, patients, consumers, whatever you want to call them, choose to interact with the healthcare system, right? Whether it's elective, non elective, emergent, non emergent. Like, I think that persists. I think what's changed really, and this is not unique to digital health. And and so let's remember, like, is cost of capital has gone way up. And the surge in demand for healthcare during the pandemic, the height of the pandemic corresponded with effectively free money. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I think it was the it was the kind of the the duo that that created this this artificial environment in digital health. And, and while the cost of capital has now corrected and you know maybe overcorrected depending on how you look at it uh, the demand hasn't and that goes back to your original question Hallie which is I do think and, and I know Dia said this as well like demand for healthcare will continue to defy economic or inflationary pressures we'll be right back after the break Okay, so in a world where the cost of capital has gone way up, how should founders think about investing in their business and innovation versus cutting costs as much as possible? Mm, that's a hard question. So I'll let Dina answer. Yeah, Dina, Dina, get, Dina gets first crack at the hard questions. <laughs> Thanks. Well, what are you telling your founders? I think that Dina, uh, well, Dina and I share a portfolio company, by the way, which is Waymark, which we're both super excited about. But, mm-hmm. but um, I'll, I think we're probably saying similar things, Hallie, which is number one, protecting if you have a strong balance sheet which you know, look I one of the one of the good things is many 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 companies overcapitalized their balance sheets in this last cycle right so to quote that trope you know cash is king and so like managing your balance sheet you know is becoming more important than ever it's not a luxury it's a necessity right number mm-hmm. one number two is you know look fundamentally capital is there, right? It's just, it's just a flight to quality. It's capital is there for really, really good companies. And so, you know, if you're not a really, really good company, you know, and there aren't many, by the way, in the early venture stage, just promising companies, but, but not yet like proven, you know, uh, uh, business models, like you've got to be really thoughtful about the story that you tell and how you position your company. And, and guess what, if you're not accomplishing multiple, you know, checked boxes on that, you know, revenue outcomes, ROI, NPS, unit economics scale, you can have a lot of potential and, and you'll be able to raise money, but you know, it's it's going to be at uh, pre-pandemic uh, funding levels and not the uh, 80 million pre-average Series A price that we've seen in the last 24 months. I don't know, Dina. Like, yeah. uh, you you say something something dramatically different. No, no, I think that's absolutely right. And of course, we're saying that to all of our companies in and outside of healthcare. But I think one thing to note, just to add on to that, that is specific to healthcare, is we we have seen the dangers of pushing for top line growth at all costs, the actual impact on 
human lives. And so there's that element as well. That is something that I, at least for me is top of mind for hopefully many others always has been top of mind as well, but that's something to consider as well. So it needs to be healthy revenue, literally and figuratively. It needs to be sustainable. It needs to be driving toward better outcomes and it needs to be growing, but growing at a pace that is also in line with, with the, with the healthy growth of the business. Yeah. I, I hear founders talking a lot about just trying to hibernate right now and kind of get to the fundamentals, stay steady with revenue, cut costs, lay off people, right? That's the biggest cost is headcount. And I'm not hearing as much from companies, especially companies without a lot of capital, about investing in really big bets. I'm not hearing like go big or go home right now, uh, which felt like for a long time, kind of the ethos of digital health. Well, I mean, it's an interesting point, Hallie, right? Like, and and fundamentally, you know, the idea of, of go big or go home works if you can go continue to raise more money, right? So like yeah. fundamentally, if, if the capital markets are shut, which, you know, they're, they're certainly not shut for, for early stage, um, I, I'd argue that, that where the capital markets are shut today is kind of that late stage private. That's probably the hardest set to come by. Like we, public public companies are marked to market, and I, I would argue that 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 public markets have uh, n- have kind of normalized to the uh, to the new reality. Early stage founders don't have the luxury of having the levers to reduce and burn and have an overfunded balance sheet. And so by and large, the seed and the company incubation series, those companies have been having to come to market, right? So, you know, you said hibernate, I would say like kick the can or, or, or yeah, stick, your exactly. head, stick, <laughs> stick, stick your head in the sand or like, oh my yeah. God, I don't want to have to fundraise right now. So do whatever yeah. you have to do to cut burn CEO. Um, exactly. we've see, we see a lot of those companies where they just like, yeah, yeah. we're just going to hope things are better in 24 <laughs> 23 and yeah. like you know i don't know that that's a strategy um but uh it's going to be an interesting moment when those companies come back and you're right they're going to be pitching a different value prop than uh top line growth yeah um so hope they'll know. be there and the weaker companies won't be there no right. that's spot on it's, it's, so, it's <laughs> you know fun. maybe opportunities will come to market for them um just because they're like you know last woman standing that's yeah. spot on. And I don't know, Dina, <laughs> if, if you agree or disagree with this, but Hallie, like, I think we're going to end up seeing, and I'm certainly not the only person saying this, a lot more consolidation uh, between, mm. not not just incumbents, but like between startups. I think you're going to start yeah. seeing a lot more of these, by the way, like stock for stock, no one has, ca- you know, stock for stock deals where digital health companies that may have overlap, that may be focused in in kind of, you know, different verticals, but have similar products are going to start saying, look, let's combine to try and get economies of scale. And like, I think we're, I think we're starting to see it. I think that's going to be the kind of the hallmark when we're exiting 23. I don't know, Dina, yeah, you I- think I'm crazy. No, no, I, I've been saying the same thing. And I think a good example in, in you know, the, the VR space is the, the merger of Oxford and Behavior uh, recently. And I think it will be more of the M than the A, to your point, Mo, because <laughs> yeah. it's going to be more like let's combine forces. I don't think a lot of these well-capitalized companies, I, I, I can say it pretty certainly, they don't want, want to be absorbing additional burn. It's very difficult to integrate a company, especially in this, yeah. you know, in this day and age. Most of these companies are also, you know, needing to, to to make cuts from their existing team, which they've worked so hard to hire and integrate. So that I, I don't think we'll see as much of, although we, you know, we might see some tiny little um, yeah. aqua hires. I, I love the idea of roll-ups. I, I feel like they're, I'm constantly trying to introduce founders to each other that I'm like, there's just enough overlap here that you guys should be working together. Um, but I, do they work? Do roll-ups work? Have you seen cases where like two companies that aren't like, really nailing it, like come together and create something even stronger? Or is it more like tying two rocks together and hoping they don't sink? (laughs) Well, look, first of all, you know, like we're we're talking about like trigger words. Like, so if lifestyle business is a trigger word, like roll up, (laughs) you know, because like it just has such a negative connotation, right? Like, you know, it it kind of makes you think of the the PE firm slapping position practices together six times and try to sell them for 10 times, right? Like that's fundamentally, like, you know, I'll reserve judgment on whether that works or not. That's not what NEA or Lux, you know, are are, are focused on. But, um, but fundamentally, you know, look, I, I think there's a way to do it thoughtfully. I mean, look, you know, 
I hope there's no IBM shareholders listening, but like IBM Watson was the quintessential dog's breakfast of like, let's slap a bunch of stuff together and maybe we can all roll it up and, and sell it for a lot of money. And guess what? Like that didn't work, right? Francisco, you know, bought that for not a lot of money. And so, you know, I don't think that like kind of putting disparate technologies together in the hope that you can build a, a flat horizontal product suite. Yeah, that doesn't work. But taking two products that are in, you know, the same category category, behavioral or imaging or whatever it might be and saying, yeah, like we can kind of synergize expenses and yet kind of maintain quality and top line like that can work and it has worked in healthcare. Yeah, um, I think the know. synergy piece of it. So rather than, you know, necessarily bringing together two small players in a, uh, you know, in a certain space and having them just add their revenue together, I think where it gets more interesting is where there is more of like a symbiosis between the companies. So, you know, the the merger of Ginger and Headspace comes to mind where, you know, first you have a content company in the wellness space and you have a care delivery company in the, in the mental health space. And now all of a sudden you actually have a very different type of company. Um, um, that's really expanding the way that you deliver care and the way that you deliver content. So I think that's interesting. Obviously, it remains to be seen how that holds up in the long term. But I think those types of of mergers, if you will, are, are, are probably more likely to happen rather than just like combining, you know, a couple of, of, of smaller companies. Yeah. What other thoughts do you have for founders who are just like bracing for whatever, <laughs> whatever 2023 is going to throw at us? Oh, how long is this podcast? I know, right? Um, (laughs) (laughs) uh, Look, uh, I, you know, I, I think investors, Hallie, you know, are, are, are thinking similar things. I think we're all kind of, you know, uh, bracing for another challenging year in terms of the broader macro and the broader environment, right? Because inflation is here to stay which means higher rates are here to stay, which means, you know, it's going to be harder to access capital, right? And and so now at the same time, like I, I want to be, you know, uh, half, glass half full. There is a lot of capital, right? And this is what separates this moment uh, here in 2023 from perhaps the GFC in 08, 09, or even internet bubble in, in 2000, 2001, which is there's still a lot of pent up capital in early stage venture, in venture growth, and in late stage privates, and, and candidly, even in, in publics. And so that capital is just behaving more rationally, right, than it has. And candidly, for healthcare, and this is relevant for founders, the tourist capital has gone. You know, mm-hmm. so, yeah. and, and if you're NEA, like, I'm thrilled at that right like not not having to like scratch my head at like a non-traditional healthcare investor like you know doing a dumb deal that like resets yeah. the market in a bad way like i'm thrilled right but yeah. for founders you have fewer shots on goal uh and and you have to plan for practically longer fundraises more targeted fundraises and i think you have to be more judicious with you know, like, what are you hoping to accomplish here, right? Because it's not just capital, it's the right kind of capital. I mean, you know, I would say this about Lux, you know, is absolutely in this category too. Like, you know, you want smart, dedicated uh, investors as opposed to like, give me the highest price, you know? And so I think for founders, you know, investors are looking at a flight to quality. And I think founders are also looking at it the same way. Like they want to be partnered with quality investors. Absolutely. Uh, you know, the other thing I would add is you know, to to be a founder is is to be exceptional, right? It's not normal, if you will, to, to found a company. And I think as a result of that, oftentimes founders think they are the exception. And it takes a little bit longer to recognize that what's happening around them can and will happen to them. I think slowly but surely 2023 is bringing that awareness to almost everyone, but I still see a little bit of that. Well, but but we can do it differently and we are different. And I think my advice to founders would be like, what is happening around us is happening to all of us. And there is no one that will be immune to it. So, you know, you need to sort of be preparing for this storm along alongside everybody else, no matter how exceptional you are. So I'm having this like visualization of like, you know, four or five years ago, starting a company in digital health was like walking into a rave. Like that's the kind of party you're preparing for. Uh, So like what, I'm curious if you guys can help me extend that analogy to like, what are we in right now? Uh, Hallie, first of all, like, 
you're dating yourself with the rave reference. I hope your <laughs> listeners are above the age of 45, okay? Because no one under the age of 45 knows what a rave is. I happen to know what a rave is. I'm sure Dina does as well. So but do like, I need to describe what a rave is? Yes, I do think you need a Wikipedia, Wikipedia link in your in your podcast okay. on this post. Um, yeah, yep. But uh, it was a thing in the 90s, kids. Look it up. Um, but uh, look, I, I The 90s I would, are back, though. Well. It's vintage yeah. high school now. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Like, I, I would say, using your analogy, Hallie, this is like the after-party brunch. And everyone's okay. looking each other in the eye. <laughs> and it's like, who made really bad decisions last night? <laughs> And, I love this. And, and who's looking around saying, you know what? I feel pretty good about my, I didn't do anything crazy right before last call. And, you know, I can look myself in the mirror and feel pretty good about where I am. And I think that there are some investors and founders that, uh, that, uh, that, that had a little too much I to drink that. the night before. And some who are like, Hey, I'm really glad I sat out yeah. that last round. Oh my I gosh. That hangover. And I need listeners to know that I did not prep you with that question. That literally just, you know, <laughs> I was like, vi- as you were describing like the tourist investors, I was just like visualizing like the, the chaos that we've lived in in this world. Um, but I, I really like that. The brunch. <laughs> Dina, do you have anything to add to that? <laughs> I was going to say a potluck of sorts or B- BYOB party, but I, I yeah. like, I, I like the, the day after analogy. I think that's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. So just to kind of close out, if you guys have any um, kind of sectors or specific companies that you're really excited about and want to share, I'd love to hear about them. Oh, yay. A chance to brag about my companies. Uh, well, it wouldn't be a podcast uh, with me without yes. me talking about women's health. So here, <laughs> here you have it. <laughs> you know, I'm super excited to see that there has been uh, a lot more investment in this space in the last few years. I think just yesterday, Aaron Broadwin over at Axios said there was a flood of funding in the fertility space. I don't think we're quite there yet. There's still a lot more room to go, uh, to yeah. go and to grow for these companies. So that's an area which is a very big one. And it's not just maternal health. It's, you know, everything. Um, you know, from menopause to, to to breast cancer to, of course, you know, the, the women's and family health space, that's one. Still think there's a ton of really interesting opportunity in the, in the R&D space. Um, so clinical trial innovation. Also spent a lot of time at JPM with a lot of the big pharma companies who have a lot of money to spend here. And so I do think there is a really interesting opportunity there. And then, you know, areas like specialty pharma and, you know, some of the others that might have previously been seen as like smaller, but actually are increasingly large and uh, open to to tech and innovation. So those are some of the areas I'm spending time in. That's really good. I think you're spot on with women's health, Dina. I think if you, if you just think about underserved constituents in the healthcare landscape, I mean, how do you not start with women at, at, at any level, right? Like, you know, um, general health, ob you know, menopause, I, the whole thing is just screaming out like white space. So I think you're absolutely dead on. And look, I, you know, Hallie, I, I just like I, there's a lot of like really exciting, you know, like who doesn't like a value based care story and, a, you know, uh, underwriting risk. And like I, but like, look, I just start with the boring stuff. Like there's so much opportunity on the admin side. There's so much opportunity in the payments side. You know, we're, we just came. um we just launched a company out of stealth called Trivalence that we incubated and founded that's that's doing that in the payments category with a really talented team uh, out of, uh, you know, Express Scripts and, and uh, 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 you know, like that is just massive opportunity, not sexy, not like out in front with consumers, but like enormous challenge, right? Like I, I think the other uh, theme, again, not like what you would, that would be top of mind for, for a tech investor when they think about healthcare necessarily, like, you know, Senior special needs plans, you know, um, like there is, if you think about one of the hardest hit constituencies by the pandemic, we're, we're seniors, right? And seniors living in in uh, retirement communities and SNFs and LTACs and, you know, ALFs and, and like, you know, they are still really hurting in, in terms of access to care. There, there are, you know, while the three of us, I'm sure, are availing ourselves of every single tele, you know, platform to to care for ourselves and our children. Believe it or not, seniors are still doing the drive to the uh, to the to the medical office building and and getting their parking validated and sitting in the waiting room and flipping through the magazine and like so. I think there is yeah. still, and we all know that's where the spend is, right? In healthcare with chronics and seniors, and so I think there is still enormous 
unmet need. When you talk about senior communities, we have a company called Curana that we founded with a really talented exec out of DeVita and, and uh, Intermountain Mark Price that's doing some really cool things for seniors living in assisted living communities and retirement communities. So, you know, and then look, I hate it when I hate it when venture capitalists come on these these things and just talk up their book. It's so self-serving. So like, I, 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 I will tell you, you, you know, I don't hate no. it when people do that on my podcast. No, <laughs> I, I, on the contrary, I'll tell you something we have no investment in uh, okay. that like I, I really think is still a, a massive unmet unmet need, despite the fact that it's gotten, you know, a fair amount of, of capital, you know, is behavioral. And we have no investments uh, in psych uh, or in behavioral uh, or in, um, you know, substance abuse. I, I think that, it, you know, there's a lot of great companies focused on it. I, I think that taking more of a services focused approach than a like you know, clinical light tech heavy approach uh, is how you're going to generate the best and most enduring outcomes for that patient population, as opposed to the like, we're going to do everything virtually. And so um, I still think there's a lot of opportunity in behavioral and, you know, we're still looking there, but haven't pulled the trigger yet. All right. So founders reach out to Mo. What stage yeah, you go. Do, you, do you like to invest in? You know, we're, we're a, we, so we just actually literally today announced our, our 18th fund, which is a $6.2 billion fund. And that's uh, 3.1 of venture and 3.1 of growth. So, you know, okay. we are like literally stage agnostic. Stage agnostic. <laughs> there you go. And Dina, what kind of companies should reach out to you? What are yeah. you looking for? We, you know, we do pre-seed to pre-IPO. So we're stage agnostic as well. Uh, and just looking for founders who, you know, fit the criteria of all the things we mentioned or working on solving really big problems um, and who are incredibly passionate about doing so in, in this environment and beyond. Amazing. All right, Dina, Mo, thank you so much for being here. Hallie, don't forget the rave link on when this podcast posts. That's <laughs> that's just like if we can leave your listeners with one enduring, you know, takeaway. It's that. There, there's your intro music, rave music. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening to this episode of The Heart of Healthcare. If you like the show, be sure to subscribe, leave a review on Apple Podcasts, follow us on social, and tell all your friends to listen. The Heart of Healthcare is a product of Offscript Health. We are a healthcare engagement company built for patients and caregivers by patients and caregivers. Our executive producers are Matthew Zachary and Andrew McDowell. Our host is Hallie Tecco. For advertising and media inquiries, email media at offscriptnot.com. That's media at offscript.com. For more information, visit offscript.com. The COVID-19 pandemic showed us how a microscopic virus could upend our lives and how unprepared our society was for it. There's so much more out there that we need to understand, which is why I recommend subscribing to Crooked Media's America Dissected, hosted by former Detroit Health Commissioner, Dr. Abdul El Sayed. Each week, Dr. El Sayed sits down with doctors, scientists, culture makers, and policy leaders to ask questions like, how could new genetic discoveries change our relationship with our own genes? How could addiction to social media change our brains? Or how even climate change could make the next major pandemic more likely? To hear discussions on these topics and more, check out America Dissected from Crooked Media. New episodes drop every Tuesday. Listen on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts.